Welcome to Learning Uncut, where we talk about real learning solutions with people who made them work. Here are your hosts, Michelle Ockers and Karen Maloney. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Learning Uncut. I'm Karen Maloney. And I'm Michelle Ockers. And today we're talking to Anne Barlett Bragg, Managing Director of Ripple Effect Group, about digital capabilities in the workplace. So Anne's currently in Spain as we record this, so we're extending a huge podcast welcome to her today. Thank you so much for joining us, Anne. Gracias, muchas gracias for that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So to kick us off then, so as part of your um, doctoral research, you looked at digital literacies and that research culminated in the development of a digital capabilities framework, a copy of which we're going to put into the show notes but I was interested to read your paper on this because it certainly busts a lot of commonly held beliefs around what digital literacy and capability encompasses. Um, Could you give us a bit of a background on the research and the structure of the framework? Yeah great Um, it's funny I wasn't actually researching into digital literacies what I was trying to understand was how people use technologies when they're learning right and it became apparent that Um, At this point, a lot of people didn't understand the concepts of sharing and learning and collaborating and and doing what we're loosely calling social learning at the moment. Um, And I started to look at this a little bit further. And as I did, the framework developed out of it. And it sort of fell loosely into these three pillars that I call them pillars, um, information literacy, network literacy, and then participatory literacy. And digital literacy literature tends to focus on narrow aspects of it. It's not encompassing what we're experiencing at work currently. It's not addressing how people are experiencing the new technologies. A lot of it in organisations, which you've probably experienced yourself, is focusing on the skills of new technologies. Mm. How do I press this button? What's different with my email system? Um, I just read an article yesterday and I was gobsmacked. How to use email better. I thought, oh, God, are we still talking about this? (laughs) I think think digital has probably hindered us a lot in our progress rather than helped us. um, Yes, I think so. So with the digital capabilities framework, it's kind of evolved then out of researching a different question in effect and the series of observations that you had uh, around what you were seeing about um, people struggling with sharing, with learning and using digital as part of learning. With the framework, what are you hoping, what purpose are you hoping that framework will serve? How do you want to see it used? I think when I developed it, it, it as you rightly sort of said, it sort of evolved out of, why can't people do this? You know, I kind of thought everybody could naturally do these things. Uh, and that's what I was actually researching is, is people's experience of it. And then it started to become apparent where the challenges lay. So I think for me, when I built out the framework and looked at it, it it's more about contributing to organisations as a a guidance framework. I don't like competency and I don't like skill training. I want this to be appropriate. In some aspects, it'll be more important to be more um, participatory mindset than to be someone with technical capabilities of building out networks. So there's aspects of it that are more relevant than others. And I think also within that, there'll be levels of Um, proficiency perhaps is a better word than capability even um, depending on your role so it's a guiding framework but the three pillars are the three key areas that I think everybody needs at least some general understanding concepts of Uh, even awareness training is missing just the awareness of what it means to share so why would I share my stuff with somebody else Why wouldn't you? You It's interesting. And I think we're at a point now where there's enough maturity in the marketplace where people have been exposed in both their personal lives and some of their work experience to a lot of these technologies. And people might look at the framework and say, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Well, yes, but we're not doing it. So it's not obvious. Yeah. So there is something around that. So I think, Michelle, it really is some kind of contribution to help people um, 
guide what they're doing. Think about what you're doing to people with the technology. Don't impose it upon them. Mm. Experience it first. Understand what the impact's going to be on, on the way they work, the way they learn, and how they're going to integrate those technologies into their daily lives in a positive manner. Yeah, yeah. So you've got these three pillars that form the high-level structure of the framework. Um, do you maybe want to dive into one of them, perhaps one that people wouldn't immediately think of or might be less familiar or they might pay less attention to um, than the others um, to building digital... Oh, just one. <laughs> one. Just a little bit for us. <laughs> With a taste. Oh, I think... Well, actually, I'd like to dive into all of them, but I shan't. Um, <laughs> I think that the one that probably um, bothered me the most was um, the network literacy, the lack of concept in people's minds, so the lack of mental models about what a network is, not because we hadn't studied networks in their official way, you know, what's a weak tie, what's a strong tie, that, that's not relevant. It's just to understand that a network is based on contributions, um, that the structure of a network is uh, about connecting others and connecting information within that so somebody knows something and connecting the information with those people and who knows that and how do I broaden my network? Some people do it naturally in their personal lives. Um, they had no trouble in the technology aspect of building out a network. Others honestly sat there and looked at it. It's like joining, say, Twitter way back when we joined Twitter and waiting for something to happen. Yeah. It, it doesn't. Um, and I think that when you see enterprises talking about enterprise social networks, they take work. People have to feed them. And also you have to build your own identity within that. You, you, the way you self-represent yourself, your profile, um, how you build relationships and reputation is so critical. And people just have no, they think they have no time to do that they think they, or they don't understand what it is that you do to do that. Yeah. So I think that's probably one of the surprises, particularly when we're used to now social networks in our private lives. So digital is about much more than the technology in this case. The gap is about an area that's actually not about any specific technology, how to use any tool, um, yep. but it's almost more around the context in which you use it and, and operating in a network. Totally. And I think the whole framework is actually not about the technology. Uh, it's really about how people, it's the mindsets and the shift that is going to be required to get to those mindsets and the knowledge and understanding. Even, I mean, now look at fake news is everywhere. How on earth do we help people figure out what's fake or not? Yep. And that's going to take a lot of work because there's some very smart ways that you can be bluffed into thinking it's authentic and how many people have got the time to dig into really testing out that information less likely to happen in organizations but there is a behavior that just goes oh i found it on the network therefore it's right yeah. mm. no question so. <laughs> it is it is exactly um just sort of going, going back to those pillars though i just think probably that was just such a really nice explanation of that first one we'd like you to do the other two as well Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> we like to make our guests happy. <laughs> uh, well, the first, the first one is the information literacy, uh, and that does actually go back to that, what we just said, the critical thinking. Yeah. Um, but also the ability, and, and Howard Rheingold in um, NetSmart talked about this, and I was using that during my PhD research um, around attention and how to manage distractions. Um, how to use or how to use the technology to filter um, those distractions mm -hmm. and cognitive overload you know when we used to do website design we used to look at the design of the information on the page but we're getting pounded with information how do we manage that overload and I'm sure we all experience it on a regular basis but we we have systems that can help us do that and in a workplace that shouldn't be an issue I shouldn't hear people going, I've got too much of this or that. 
they should have their filter mechanism set up. So I don't know that people know how to do that. Um, data analytics and big data is getting so big now. We've all got to have an understanding about data at a high level and what it means, what is quality data, what are we looking for, how do we want to use it? And again, I don't think people even have a clue what that is. They just keep collecting, <clears throat> like out of an LMS, things like completions. Woohoo! Mm. What does so, that Andy, mean? Do you, think, do you think with something like data analytics, it's a bit like being a responsible car owner and knowing enough about how your car works that you can have a conversation with someone who's suggesting they need to do some work on it and know whether that sounds right or not. The same with data analytics. We don't all need to be experts in data analysis, but we need to understand the fundamentals of it well enough to be able to know what we're looking at with a piece of data analysis and judge the quality of it or to know what to ask for with data analysis. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good analogy with the car. Although these days, Michelle, you know, they've got computers in them and you don't get to play in the engines anymore. Oh. Um, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's sort of those fundamental underpinning understandings that are, are needed and if I'm a manager in in an say an L&D department and I need some data to demonstrate the impact that learning's having I need to understand what data is that that I need to collect mm -hmm. then how am I going to get it and how am I going to analyze it to present it back to people outside of L&D that makes sense you know it, it's sort of fundamentals um, and we don't do that anymore we just, it's like teaching maths. Why bother? You've got a calculator, you know, but you do need some fundamentals. Okay, I was going to ask about the participatory literacy, which I think you've touched on a little bit about, you know, people having a mindset around sharing and knowing how to share, but maybe you can um, dig into that a little bit for us and what, what that set of literacies looks like. Yeah, there's a couple of aspects in that, again, that were quite surprising. Um, and there's literacy that talks about internal horizons and external horizons. Um, and there's a nice little test if everybody wants to do this at home. If you write an M for Michelle on your forehead, no, actually don't write an M, write an E. Yes. Which way does the E go? A capital E. So are you writing it so that you can see it in your, you know, internal mind? That's what it looks like. You're facing the E. Or are you writing it so that when I'm looking at you, Michelle, you can see you've got a capital E on, written on your forehead? In my case, One, you'd be able to see it the way yes. I see Yes, exactly. So that means you're thinking about me who asked you the question and writing it for me as opposed to writing it for you, an internal horizon. So people with an external horizon um, tend to be more participatory. They're aware of others and what knowledge they have and what interests they might have. Um, they're the people that will send you a link to an article and say, oh, Karen, remember we talked about that about a month ago? I just saw this and thought you might be interested. That's a participatory mindset. You're very much aware of what's going on. And that relates to sort of systems thinking as well what I do and how it impacts the rest of the system or the organisation or my colleagues or my team members. Um, not everybody has it. Naturally, it is able to be learned and drawn out through awareness. So that's one of the interesting ones. Um, the other one in the participatory mindset is also that ability to give feedback loops. Uh, and I was talking to someone a little while back who was saying their behaviour on Facebook, for instance, they never like any of their family's contributions. And I said, oh, yeah, why, why is that? She said, well, I don't need to. I said, okay. She said, they know I like them. I said, well, how do they know you've seen the post or what you think about it? And she pondered that for a moment and then said, well, does that matter? So I said, well, have you asked them about that? So she trotted off and she came back about a week later and said to me, oh, my God, you know, it's the epiphany <laughs> moment. She said, my sister thinks I hate her because I never like her posts or comment on what she's doing. And I said, because she doesn't know if you've seen it, you're showing, you're not demonstrating any interest in somebody else. So feedback loops, take that into the workplace, feedback loops. Someone 
spends a lot of effort making a contribution and nobody does anything. Mm. And you sit there in online land going, I'm really lonely. Nobody likes my work. Um, I'm not adding value to the network, to the ecosystem. So looking at how your contributions, even if they're just likes or star ratings or a small comment, thanks for that, Michelle, just makes you, you we all know that feeling. There's a little bit of a dopamine rush and you go, mm. oh, that was nice, great, <clears throat> you know, and it's not a competition about likes. This is actually about feedback loops. Yeah. Um, and when, in work in progress, that's fantastic. Actually, I was working on something similar. Have you seen this work? Oh, no, I haven't. Gosh, that's really great. Thanks for that, Karen. You know, that is part of participatory mindsets as well. Yeah, that's um, a really nice reframe, the, the thinking of things like, like just an acknowledgement through a like or a star or whatever it is on the media you're using as a feedback loop. Um, yeah, it's just it, some of them can be very small actions, but without them, you have no idea what people think of it. Yeah. Um, you know, so you feel bad. You know what strikes me as you're talking about um, the, this set of capabilities is a lot of the thinking, writing, looking ahead around future skills um, is talking about the um, increasing importance of soft skills rather than technical mm. skills um, into the future. Um, and it feels like there is a, a lot of that soft skill flavour. It's not about the technology. It's about all these other things about mindset uh, and softer skills, Anne. Yeah, I think so. And I think we're also, um, as you sort of touched on, I, I think we're doing a, not a full circle, but we, we are reverting back to some of the things like how to write and publish things, you know, write publicly. That's quite hard for some people. But reflection comes back into it as well. Mm. Um, having those the information literally, the, the ability to sit back and question critically, and I don't mean critically in a negative way, to critique something and be able to give meaningful feedback. We don't have time for that, so we don't do it. But it, I think it's even more important than we've ever had, particularly at the moment. I think, I think things are getting really out of control. And it's time that we bring it back in control. Bring it back in. <laughs> bring it back in. Yeah. Um, when we first spoke about doing this podcast, my, my original angle after reading material was to find out who had implemented the framework because we're all about the, the practical application of stuff here. Um, and we wanted to get some tips from you on how to apply it. But interestingly, um, there haven't been many, well, there hasn't been much uptake of the framework in organisations, which really surprised me. Um, can you shed some light on why you think that is? I think it's a really interesting time that we're going through. Um, there is still a lot of interest in digital literacy training. Um, and I remember, Karen, we're still talking about people that are still putting people into classrooms and still training people to use software. Use software, oh my God, without workflows, but don't get me started, that's a whole... Oh, without workflows, yeah. okay. So again, systems thinking, there's no um, bigger picture uh, concept of the impact that the software is going to have on workflows, on the way they work and the way they share. How are we going to help people work effectively? So I think at a management level and higher, there's, there's only an inkling of understanding coming through of the impact on people. Um, it's more, we've hit some productivity stagnation points at the moment. We've got as many fandangled pieces of technology as just about possible. Uh, we're starting to introduce AI, artificial intelligence, and use algorithms to crunch things for us and do bits and pieces, automate things, which is lovely. They're probably very efficient at it. But we're still not really looking at the key problem, which is looking back at the people. It's not about the technology, it's about the people. Yeah. So I think that's still an awareness level that is there. Some people, um, and working out loud has been part of it, um, uh, working on some of those changes and the way people share and, and do things, but there's still a bigger picture. So I think it's early days and we almost have to hit another brick wall before we'll wake up and go, oh, maybe we've got to look at what the people are doing. Yeah, which, which kind of leads me into my next question and is it's around that, so it seems like it's currently sitting in the too hard basket for most yeah. organisations, but if we know that sort of, looking at a framework like this would be a benefit, to, a huge benefit to organisations. How can we help get the ball rolling? 
I think as L and D guys again, um, I go back to the that L and D as facilitators, as people that understand the concepts behind how people learn. Um, I think the role, and, and you have the exposure across organisations, yeah. the ability to sort of say, okay, when we're doing this training, we need to do this as well. Um, it, some of these capabilities need to be embedded in everything that we're doing. And we spend a lot of time in classrooms, or we used to, because I don't do classrooms anymore, but you spend a lot of time in classrooms mm-hmm. um, trying to get people to participate in activities. Yeah, we don't worry about how they participate in the workplace. Well, why yeah. not? Uh, we don't sit down, you mentioned workflows, and understand that because we've got these new technologies, we can actually change the way we work. Oh, shock horror. Wouldn't that be nice? Instead of trying to force antiquated ways of working into modern technologies. So until we start to get that and have those epiphany moments around that, I think this is like kind of like, oh, well, we've done digital literacy or, or we taught them how to use that so they should just know but yeah, well, I, th- I think that, that that's an interesting point. Actually, I mean, I, I you know coming from a background of I kind of got into the world of L and D through IT training around the time that um, everybody got plonked a PC with a mouse on their desk and <laughs> had no idea what to do with it. And I, so, but at that time, you kind of had to do Windows literacy training before you were allowed to go and do Excel training or Word training, and you had to kind of yeah. show certificates before you could go to the next level and things. I mean, and that's, I feel that I still to this day use those tools way more efficiently than many people I know because I was actually shown how to use them from the outset. And I think there is a a misconception that there is just because it's a tool, everything is intuitive and we should all know how to use things, especially the the Gen Ys, those younger generations, the millennials that we were talking about previously. It's like this, you know, it's on a phone, it's an app, so they, they should all be able to use it. Yeah. And, and, in in my, all my research, there is no evidence that points to the younger generations being more proficient than the older <clears throat> than the older generations. Absolutely none. That's just a complete mythbuster. And in fact, I just um, got uh, Clark Quinn's new book, um, Millennials, Goldfish, and Other Training Misconceptions, and um, there's some really great debunking things in there. I go, yes. But why do we keep doing them? Why do we keep training people how to use email? Why do we keep training people on customer service? There's got to be something fundamentally wrong with the system Mm. that creates you're still not emailing properly. (laughs) Sorry. Really? (laughs) So it's bigger than that. I think one of the things that's coming through right now that's got to really, I hope it, impacts Australia as much um, is the GDPR, the privacy regulations being yeah. brought in by the EU in a uh, couple of weeks and counting. At how many people are aware of the impact this is going to have on the way we work mm. uh, and what data we're collecting on people, what rights you have as individuals. Impact like that and, and look at what just happened with Facebook and data. Yeah. We, we private data we we all need to just stop for a moment and go whoa we're hurtling really fast into some of these things um and the ethics behind them almost i probably need another little column actually on ethics actually (laughs) the ethics of what we're doing um we need to just stop for a sec take take stock put on our sensible brains um and, and kind of talk rationally amongst each other how we get this through this is this is big. Yeah. Do I sound scary? It's big. What, what, does, <laughs> what does Donald say? It's really big. Oh, I think it's it's approaching where you are and stretching in the ways you can as well, though, isn't it? So yeah. you know, you, you've talked there about um, the, the flavour of what I got you saying there was about if you're rolling out technology, then embed some of these other capabilities in the learning solutions around that technology. But sometimes it's not even about rolling out technology it's about looking at a business problem or opportunity and looking at how can some of these mindsets be incorporated in a solution so for instance very briefly um, when I was working at Coca-Cola Amatol the engineering manager the national engineering manager said to me we've got some long tenured engineers who are about to retire and we need to you to develop some training courses based on what they know so we don't lose the knowledge Um, But what we did instead was set up communities of practice and we ran a four-week 
online sort of webinar-based program. And the first two weeks were all really around participatory mindset. It was about, you know, what is a network? Why would you participate in one? What are some of the benefits? And we set them up rather than in learning spaces, in working spaces, to start interacting and start experiencing using the technology in their daily life and building networks. So it's about thinking differently about how to solve a business problem in a way that gets people doing these things. Does that make sense? Totally. I think that's a fabulous example, Michelle. I remember when you were doing that and that was exactly, that's exactly the kind of mindset that I think L&D have to bring to the table with, with their solutions. Um, and a, a point that you made right at the beginning, a lot of people try to fix problems. Um, very few people at the moment are stepping back. Again, I keep going back to systems thinking, step back and say, okay, what is the problem? Or actually, is there an opportunity here? To, yep. to reinvent what we're doing. We're spending so many time fixing problems that is anyone saying, well, actually, it's the problem that we're fixing the same problem again rather than looking at the opportunity of doing something differently. But I think embedding it in, in the way we're working, looking at the workflows is probably the best way and leading by example. Now, that means l &D has to step up and lead by example and, and actually model these behaviours themselves. So that's my challenge back to L&D is come on, guys, pick up your game and do what we should be doing and offering those solutions and demonstrating how this works. Mm. Yeah. Come on, guys, be brave. <laughs> Absolutely. Get Absolutely. And sometimes that, that bravery is around having different conversations with people in the business as well. So, Anne, do you have any tips, you know, if someone from learning and development is listening to this podcast and saying and looking at your framework and saying, yes, I want to start doing something with this, but I need to start engaging some of my key stakeholders around this, any tips for how to use the framework to support a discussion around developing digital capability with a people lens? Um, for, for people to have that conversation with business leaders or other key stakeholders in their organisation? Yeah, this is a great question, Michelle. I think it's, um, and I think one of our biggest challenges is being able to engage in those conversations. I think we need to look for, there's, there's no single one size fits all, there's no silver bullet, as we all know in L&D, um, but there's being able to identify where there's an opportunity and your example back uh, with Coca-Cola was great. You know, there's an opportunity here to actually think differently about the problem. So it's sitting down with somebody that comes to you and says, I need email training. <laughs> and sitting down saying, why do you think you need email training? Let's talk about what the problem is. Gosh, back in the old days, l &D used to do analysis and needs analysis and, and understanding the whole system. And I think those conversations have to come back again. I, th I think the reactionary stuff, just train them on how to do something. As I've said many times before, training is for dogs and babies. Um, we're adults now and we need a whole stack more to cope with what's going on and, and how we're going to manage through this next decade or so of artificial intelligence, of intelligent systems, of robots, of all this sort of stuff. Well, there's a whole stack more out there. Blockchain now, how many people understand the concept behind blockchain? How many people I understand try. these? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, you try. I, I keep trying. It's, yeah. <laughs> keep trying. Don't give up. It's work in progress. <laughs> it is. It is. So I think they're conversations that we just have to sit down and maybe it's getting a group together and brainstorming what are the bigger problems? You know, marketing's got a problem with this. Production's got a problem here. Well, maybe actually it's the same problem and it's the workflow, the whole, the whole system that needs to be re-engineered, re rethought about, reframed even. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we did speak about maybe putting together a small resource that people can download, um, which we'll talk about after here, but to give you some, to give people some sort of questions and um, sort of triggers maybe to take away, to start identifying those opportunities to start having the conversation because we're by no means saying, oh, here's the framework, go and implement that. We understand mm -hmm. that we're a few steps behind that at the moment. So um, there will be, there's a few resources of Anne's that we're going to um, add to the show notes, um, including obviously a copy of that framework and, um, her article and a couple of other bits and pieces as well. So and and do you know what I did for you, Michelle, Michelle you and do? Karen? Just <laughs> um, 
One of the things I've been looking at is, is sort of self-assessments and knowing that people don't self-assess very well, but at least it's a starting point. And also understanding proficiency that I talked about before. So forget competence, proficiency. Um, for each of the three pillars, I put together a couple of questions to ask people to rate themselves how proficient they are. Um, and, uh, you know, things like uh, how do you manage distractions online? What's your ability? How proficient are you at that? How do you know how to manage cognitive overload? Uh, how do you visually represent your network? Do you know how many people can't draw what their network looks like? There's a challenge for you. Mm -hmm. How do you use your networks? You know, think about that yourself yeah. um, and develop your own proficiencies around that. So I put some little questions together and you can come out with an answer. That would be great. Thank you so much. Cool. Are you expecting us to report back, Anne? Uh, I think not. Like a re um, remedial support? <laughs> I, could, I could offer to do remedial support on that, absolutely. But uh, no, I think okay. it's uh, there as a little bit of a trigger for your own actions. Well, okay. on the, um, the page where we're going to put all of these, so every podcast will have its own page and there'll be comments on the bottom. So if anybody listening is uh, there and wants to contribute to that discussion, then it'll be on the, on the, um, on the page on our website. Fantastic. And I'll be there if you need me. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so finally, just before we wrap up, could you share with us, Anne, um, the biggest thing that you do for your own personal development, professional development? I have been spending some time. I, it's a great question because I've always read and consumed a lot of information. Imagine. But I've been challenging myself recently to read things that I know I'm not going to agree with. Mm -hmm. um, to That's force great. myself to understand the other perspectives mm -hmm. because when you are having these difficult discussions, I need to understand more deeply why there's resistance. Um, and, I, and I challenge myself with things like that. Blockchain, cryptocurrencies, I'm challenging myself to actually get a deep understanding of it, mm -hmm. even when I'm, <laughs> I'm not technical enough to build a blockchain. Mm -hmm. What is that? But it's the opposing opinions I'm really trying to understand to to help us be able to work through them um I'm not saying that i've got the right opinion they might think they're right but why is that so i think that's one of the things i'm really challenging myself is stop reinforcing and, and reading only people who agree with me look at others and and see what the other perspectives are so a very broad range and definitely outside L and D look at all the research that's happening across other areas yeah. um, to make sure that you're right across the latest thinking around that seems things. to be um, a bit of a trend actually when we're talking to people um, there's lots more getting outside of L and D which is I think where a lot of the innovation is coming from um, in people that yep. are doing good stuff in their organizations so something to think about thank you so definitely. if anybody um, wants to get in touch with you to find out more about research digital capabilities i can't even say it digital capabilities um, the framework etc what's the best way for them to do that would that be linkedin or is there another channel that you prefer linkedin is great um that's a great starting point um email me but of course remember that email is such a painful opportunity. <laughs> apparently no, nobody's using it properly so um <laughs> no one's using it properly but it's still a great way to communicate with external contact yeah we're doing it okay um all right we'll, we'll put a link to your profile on the bottom so i think that's all we have for now so thank you so much Anne, for um sharing your work and insights with us and um really appreciate you taking the time out to be with us today all the way from sunny spain <laughs> it's not so sunny <laughs> thanks karen and michelle oh, i've had a really great time as well and hasta la vista uh, adios 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 <laughs> Thanks for listening. Join the conversation on Twitter or LinkedIn using hashtag learninguncut and head over to learningexperts.com.au forward slash podcast to access resources discussed in this episode.